Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So my name is Deanna Whitty Walker, and I'm the Executive Director at South Pole Historical Museum. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, much appreciation is extended to NOFO Real Estate, who has generously sponsored this lecture series. Because of their generosity, we are able to offer these educational programs free of charge. Many thanks also to Janet Douglas and the town of Southfold for allowing us to host in this terrific space. Um, if you haven't already, please check the back table for some additional information about Southfold Historical Museum. I just want to note that this is the second talk in our winter lecture series, which is themed local farming through the years. Related to this theme, Southfold Historical Museum is considering curating an exhibit about the labor camps that were prevalent in the 1900s on the North Fork. While we have archival items in our collection, we feel that the input of the community is essential to curating this exhibit. So should you be um, interested in staying informed about future community conversations related to the labor camps, we ask that you please sign up on the clipboard in the back. Um, I would like to introduce Al, but before I do so, I just want to ask you if you have a cell phone, if you would be so kind as to take it out and silence it. A reminder always seems to help, including me, which I better check mine when I go. But meanwhile, we are fortunate to have Al Krupski here today to, to present Krupski Farming. Al is well known for his public service. He currently serves as Suffolk County Legislator a position he's been elected to hold for the past 10 years. Prior to that, he held positions in South Hill Town as well. But Al has, for a much longer time, been a farmer. A fourth generation farmer, he grew up in a, in a farming family and continued the tradition alongside his wife, Mary. The legacy continues through their children, who are also part of Krupski Farms 10. I think we're in for a real treat. So um, thank you, Al, for your generosity and willingness to share your story. Please join me in welcoming Al Krupski. Well, thanks. thank you so much. That's, that was very nice. And I'm really, I'm thrilled to be here because it is a topic that's, that's near and dear to my heart. And, um, and so there are, I mean, I, I'm looking out here with neighbors and, and, uh, and friends and Actually, my favorite sister's here too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, sister. Yes. Um, so last, the, the last uh, lecture you had was Tom Wickham. His family was here for decades. So relatively speaking, the Krupskis are pretty much newcomers here. <laughs> my, and I forgot to bring it out of the newspaper. My uh, great grandfather, Joe Krupski, came here with, his, and I'm not sure if it was with his wife Elizabeth or whether they got married here. But a lot of the um, uh, relatives came over in about the 1890s. And at first they worked in the brickyards in Heshamana. And either Sages or Sanford's brickyards. And I know my grandfather Julius was, who had the farm where Len's Vineyard is. Uh, Julius was born in, in a house there right across the street from the brickyards. And my father always told me that story. So they, they came here from what is um, not now Poland, they said probably like Belarus, further to the east. Uh, the Krupskis came from, from way to the east. They called my great-grandfather Ruski because he, he used to play cards at the store here on the corner of Stump Lane with, with all the old Yankee farmers and uh, because he could understand and speak Russian because he came from the, then there was, Poland was partitioned and he came from the Russian side of Poland. So that was, and it was always a positive story. He came here and he bought the farm where uh, Pindar Vineyard is now, and, and they, they lived there. So the, the family's been here from, I'm the fourth generation. And uh, I grew up, and Sue, you know, we grew up with our brother on the potato farm here in Petro, where the pumpkin farm is, and you know, they were iconic. And you always thought as a kid that that was gonna be, that was forever, right? You grew up and it was all potatoes. Every, every neighbor you knew, all our relatives, my mother was a cider from South, uh, from, from Manitoc, and if you've ever seen the potato chip bags, Marty cider potato chips, Marty and Carol have the, they, they grow the potatoes and make the chips, 
Uh, the logo on the bag is our great grandfather's logo. And so you always think that's all your relatives, all your um, all your friends, they, they were raised potatoes. And that's what it, all it was out of here was potatoes. And in the fall, when they killed the vines before they dug the potatoes, the potato bugs would be crawling across the road. And the, and the, the, the wind from the cars would pile them up and, and pile on, on the main road. And they'd be climbing up the side of the house. It was really quite, quite something. So everything changed, you know. It was it was a big. I saw a lot of changes in my lifetime, um, and they had they had good years raising potatoes. My my grandfathers and my uncles and whatnot. Um, after the war, it was a big crop. Potato. Uh, there were a couple things with potatoes. One, the production here was more expensive than elsewhere. And I remember my grandfather John Sider. He had friends out in the Midwest, and he, you know, he saw these potato storages, they would hold up to a million hundred weight. And it got to the point where they could um, they could hold them for two years because they were five years old. So in the old days when they made money on Long Island potatoes, maybe there'd be a, a drought in the Carolinas or Delaware somewhere and the potato crop would be off. Maybe there'd be an early freeze in Maine and the potato crop would be off. So Long Island would have a good crop every four or five years and be able to reinvest in equipment you know, pay off any kind of debt, they, they'd be able to keep making money. It wasn't like every year they were guaranteed making money. But it was it was very uh, regional. Once they started raising potatoes more commercially further west, that that market advantage just completely disappeared. Plus, people used to eat five potatoes and eat potatoes every night. And I don't know if a lot of people have peeled potatoes in a long time, you know? So that, that, that the fresh market, for potatoes really kind of disappeared. There's a lot of market for processing, mm -hmm. and that's still a big market in the country for processing, really, mm -hmm. that kind of disappeared. So, I went, and I'll take questions afterwards, but I went away to um, college, University of Delaware, I got a degree in plant science, and I almost went to uh, Virginia Tech and for soil chemistry because I was really interested in, in science, uh, plant pathology, plant physiology. And uh, I, but I, after four years, I came home. I was going to be the great American farmer. And my father and I raised cauliflower for three years in a row, a lot, 20 to 30 acres a year. Uh, out of that, we got strong back. That's all we got out of <laughs> Because cauliflower is really hard work. You have to bend over constantly to tie it. And then when you cut it, it's always, it's always cold in the fall, in November and December. Um, and you have to be wearing rain gear, and it's muddy. And you're lifting these crates of cauliflower and putting them on a moving truck as it goes to the field. So after three years of really actually losing a lot of money, we shipped in 100 to 150 crates a day in the fall to the market, uh, six days a week, and we lost money three years in a row. Um, it was just wholesale and shipped it away, and, and you had no, uh, you know, it was just, you had no ownership after that. You got what you got. Um, we transitioned into, uh, into uh, you know, more row farming, a lot bigger diversity in crops. And that has been uh, you know, the way we've gone from there. And, and now much more, season, much more seasonal. You know, we used to be open with uh, peas in the spring, strawberries, we don't, that, we, we've cut, completely gotten away from that. So I am married to Mary, and we have three, um, three children, uh, Nick, Colleen and Kim, who all live in town. They're all part of the operation. They all work off the farm, but they're all part of the operation. Uh, we have, uh, Nick and Rachel have two little girls, uh, two and four, and Kim and Brandon, who live on the main road here, right in my parents' house that they renovated a couple of years ago. Uh, they have Henry's two, well, a year and a half, and they're gonna have a, a little girl at the end of the month, so kind of anything. <laughs> so um, we're very happy because they're all part of uh, the operation, and um, and you know we'll see where it goes from there. So that's briefly the, the story. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone has any questions about anything that I've seen, you know, in my lifetime. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
I have a microphone, so I'm happy to walk around if you have a question and want to raise your hand. May I start, though? Because I do think I read something about how the family kind of transitioned to pumpkins. Yes. And I, I, I mentioned the memory that I have with my children going to Krupski Pumpkin Farm from Southwold Schools and your mom teaching the kids about the different pumpkins. So would you want to share about the transition to pumpkins? I, for some reason, I always liked pumpkins. It was just a personal thing, and so when I was... Uh, 16 in high school, I asked my father and grandfather because it was always when they planted potatoes, you'd plant so much seed, you'd buy so much seed potatoes, and you'd plant so much, and there was always extra land at the edge of the fields. And um, I said, Can we plant pumpkins? And that's how it started. So they were very nice. They, they were like, Okay, so we started planting <laughs> a few rows, a few acres. And it kind of and it grew into that because in 1978, when I was a high school senior, the um, they, I don't know why they did this, because they always had the big potato storages, and if you go to Len's Vineyard, you see the, um, you go into the tasting room in, in my grandparents' barn. But on both sides, there's these big potato storages, and they were built specifically to store potatoes. They're very, um, very well insulated. It's cement floors, and the potato truck was back in, and you put it, it's called a bin loader, because you're loading a bin. And the potato truck, the chain would go down into the bin loader, the bin loader would bring them up and make the potato piles. And the room, you know, the building was much taller than this, so as kids, we could, we could climb up the pile of potatoes <laughs> and play. And it was quite the, quite the thing. So um, I don't know why in 1978 they decided there's a, if you go in the tasting room, and there's a, there's a little cellar underneath there. So years ago when it was built, I'm sure long before my grandparents um, owned the farm, that good old barn there, they, I don't know why they put potatoes in the cellar there, because the cellar's kind of low, it's a stone-lined cellar, and you've got all this barn space, and they, so what happened was, and I always remember, because I, we always had friends uh, working, um, I mean, Scott Russell has the stories of working for my parents when I was in, in college, and the, the potatoes rotted down there in the cellar. And it was the, it was the worst. And after that experience, so you have, you have a big pitchfork, somebody's holding the bag, a friend of mine from, from high school, and I would shovel them into the bag. And then they had like a little, um, like a little conveyor belt, they put them on the conveyor belt and they'd go up to the, to the next level of the barn. So my father was dumping them out in the barn and decided to try to drive out. It was awful, and the smell just got in your skin. It was just terrible. I don't know why they did that. That was like a. Anyway, that was that was, and that was. We were fortunate because we quit raising potatoes that year, and the potato market got it did. It got worse economically until 1982 when they had a really bad year, and most of the potatoes broke. Went out. Um, so we were we were kind of fortunate. We went out in '78, so we hanging around for another, another couple of years. So the. Now, we transitioned into uh, sweet corn and, and watermelons and peas. We grew peas for a long time, uh, some strawberries. So we transitioned into all these other row crops, and then we, we transitioned into retail. Now, we, we did have, yes, pumpkins. We did have a lot of, that was in the middle of our cauliflower experiment there, but that. <laughs> but they always had, they always had, even with the potatoes as a kid, they always had peppers, they always had some, some other greens, uh, cucumbers. I, I still can't eat cucumbers to this day because <laughs> Sue and I picked so many cucumbers as kids that I can't. I don't like the smell. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, Al really just wanted to answer your questions. We we really had a really talkative group at our last one, so just please think about what you'd like to ask. I'm going to head over here to Mr. Bayless and give him the microphone. Hi, Al, I was wondering, did you remember the cauliflower auction they used to have in Riverhead? Yes. Because this was 1935, my father would go in and buy maybe 150 crates of cauliflower to take into the market. And he wouldn't buy it, unless it cost about 50 cents a, get, a crate. Yes. <laughs> yes, no, that was the one, the, the cauliflower block in Riverhead was, um, that was a big thing. Yeah, and it was so much, and, and we had a lot of relatives in Riverhead, but they also had a block here on the corner of Young's Avenue in South Hall. Yeah, they used to line the trucks up there. Yeah, well, I have pictures of the one in Riverhead when there would be 250 trucks 
lined up to go through that auction. Every and day. today is that you moved into retail, but what is the Krupski business now? Sure, so we still raise about you know, 30 to 40 acres of, of, of row crops. So the business has shrunk quite a bit, you know, acreage-wise, and we try to just grow, you know, a lot of the farms transition into row crops, then they start to buy and sell produce, and if you see if farm stands open in April with tomatoes and watermelons, you know, they're not home. So we, we, we didn't want to get into that. Everybody everybody in our family works off, I mean, not everybody works off the farm. Um, and it kind of fell to Mary, my wife, to do all the work. That's the way it kind of worked out. <laughs> so, so we had to really adjust everything um, around that reality, that if the rest of us are not there every day, what is she expected to do? So she still does run the farm stand, and she does all the, um, the, the book work and everything. But, and she manages you know, the farm stand. So we still raise um, what, we, what we sell, we, you know, the Indian corn and the sweet corn and the watermelons and the corn, the winter squashes and all that. And, but we cut the season down. We used to have, you know, we used to really try to have early tomatoes. We had a greenhouse, we were growing tomatoes in the greenhouse. And we gave, you know, we gave a lot of that up. I, I could talk about the labor stuff later, but um, I was asked, about 10 years ago to speak to a group in Riverhead about the role of women in agriculture. Because you think, oh, because you know, Tom Whitman spoke you know, last time, and I'm speaking today, but I tell you that the role of, of women in agriculture has is, is been critical. And you think about the family farms, and you do see the man on the tractor. But really behind that, and making all the decisions at the kitchen table, is, is the, the farm wife. And, um, and kind of holding a lot of it all together in many ways. So that's sort of, I, I think it's, it's, I mean, it's acknowledged by everybody in farming, but it's not the face of agriculture, right? But to have that, because I had aunts, you know, and my grandmothers, of course, and if pressed into service, if, if the help didn't show up, you know, my grandmothers or my mother would be driving the potato truck when they were harvesting. Because they had to harvest that day because it was going to rain the next day, so you had to get everything. So they, that, that was so, that's something I wanted to mention. Women play a, a critical role in keeping the farms together. Really, really important. Okay. Um, thank you for your very lucid presentation. I am very curious about when potato farming was introduced to the North Fork or Long Island. And does it have anything to do with the potato, Irish potato famine of 1840s that became a commercial commodity here? Sure, so, you know, potatoes are, are native to, you know, this hemisphere. The reason potatoes became uh, so popular as a crop on Long Island, it, had, it really didn't have anything to do with the potato famine. It was because, um, really economic. So, and agronomics, because you could grow potatoes here, the climate was really good, we've got adequate rainfall, there was no irrigation on a farm before the 1950s. So they had, they had adequate rainfall, you had a booming, if you look at Nassau, Western Suffolk, you think about hundreds of thousands of acres of potatoes on Long Island, in, in pretty much like everyone's lifetime here. Like, so there were potatoes grown, the city was a huge market, Fresh, fresh market potatoes. So they had a ready market. It was a good, it was a good crop to grow to make money. It, it did start to change in the 60s. And I remember our neighbor on the main road here, he, the four brothers that got together. What happened in the 60s? Now you had to buy big equipment, big, com big combines. Before it was a one road digger. And you, I'm sure you've seen pictures in the historical society of people picking them in baskets, dumping them in bags loading the bags on a truck. It was, it was a different um, production. Once they went to the, the, the big diggers, now you have a big complicated piece of equipment to run and store. Now you've got to have bulk body trucks. And that 
you know, and I drove many a bolt body truck as a kid down the road with no brakes, right? It was, they were in bad shape if you had what you had because it was the harvest season, you had to, you had to dig. And then, um, and now you have to build these potato storages, huge storages, and you'd hope that the potato economics, when I was in college, they were all the cooperative extensions on, in the country, they were all looking around, how could I help my, my local growers? And they said, the cauliflower market, well, the price spikes around Thanksgiving. So what happened is, so many other areas of the country started raising cauliflower that the pri well, price locally actually went down around that time because the market was flooded. So that was, it was just an economic thing. It was just overproduction uh, countrywide. And now you could think, you know, that with shipping and everything, it was just a big flood of market. And one other thing, you, you guys grow popcorn yes. on the cob the yes. best. <laughs> the best. I, I send it to my son in Japan. <laughs> but you're the I think you're the only you're the only place I've ever seen it and it's extremely limited time frame, right? Yes, I mean, we brought it and we've brought it for years. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Hi. Um do you see the uh uh, right, uh, development rights transfer program as, as a long-term benefit for future generations, like your generation six, seven, and eight, or do you think it's more for the current group? No, no, it's, it's got a benefit. It's got a benefit for the community. And well, that I know. Yeah. So the, the, the county started the land preservation program in the, in the 70s. And you know, like I said before, there were so many acres of farmland on Long Island, and they could say, see these, these acres of farmland being handed over and really quickly. So the county had the foresight, they, they started the land, it was a farmland preservation program at the time. In the 80s, there was a lot of pressure in town. And so South Old Town started the program of its own. So the, you, need, you need a couple things when you are preserving farmland. One, you need a willing seller. So you have to convince, and I remember my grandfathers and my great uncles, having back in the 70s, having the conversation about if you sell development rights in your farmland, will it ever be worth anything? Will you ever be able to sell it again? So that was a big thing about their equity they were worried about because really they were all their eggs in one basket to farm. They might have made money farming. They could buy equipment, they could buy a car, they could educate their children, but they weren't making like retirement money, right? So they needed, they needed, they, there was no health insurance that, that was there being paid, and, and they didn't have that kind of safety net. So this was their equity. So that was a big part of the conversation. Is this the, is that farmland going to be worth anything in the future? Um, the town's pro, so, uh, so you need a willing seller. You need a funding source, right? <coughs> now we're really lucky to have the, the community preservation fund as a funding source. And then you need a, a mechanism. And every town has a different one. The county has a different one uh, for for bringing those two things together and, and preserving that farmland. So I think the community benefit is you get to um, you, this land is preserved in perpetuity, and it's not on um, the, the community to pay for any upkeep or maintenance. It's still in the tax roll. So that's a, that's a big benefit for the community. For the grower, it is a big benefit because while it's worth way less. And if you sold your development rights in the 80s, you didn't get, you got the, the fair appraisal. If you sold it, you know, today, we're still buying development rights today. Um, you know, you get the appraised amount. It's a strict uh, process. You get two appraisals. We go through a process of the county called ETRB, which I sit on, and it's, it's we go through with the county appraisers. You, um, you set the price there based on the two independent appraisals. And then you make an offer to the landowner. So there's a there's a real really good strict process to do that. I don't. Um, I, I, I so the the benefit to the landowner in the end is you still own it and you can still sell it and there's always a market for it. The problem is so the market for preserved farmland on the North Fork has been very stable for decades. The price really hasn't gone up much, but there's been a ready market and there's been a lot of transfers. And there's been a lot of people who want to get into agriculture and they can afford to because that they could buy that land at a greatly reduced rate. So there has been a very ready market for preserved farmland. What happened on the South Fork 
is you have these, um, you know, these entertainers and whatnot who have a lot of money. Some of these, they were paying two, three hundred thousand dollars an acre for preserved land, and then not farming it. And so that became a problem. And the Buchanan Land Trust has been a great advocate for trying to keep land, farmland, in production. And so they came up with this enhanced easement, and I know Southampton Town has used it uh, a couple times to, to make sure that the, the land can only be used for food production. Because once, you know, it's, it's just a matter of cost. If the, if the preserved farmland is selling for $200,000 an acre, you can't, you're never gonna, if that's just an investment, People. They're never going to farm it. Never try to make money off it. So, um, so it's it's worked out very well here. The, the farmland preservation program in Southall has worked very well. There's there's money available, <laughs> but out of the five towns, um, the community preservation fund has taken in almost two billion dollars. It's just but eighty five percent goes to Southampton East Hampton because that's where the, the high Price houses are so you get you just get the transfers in your town. Um, ten over ten years ago, Riverhead borrowed heavily against future revenues, and so they're paying their debt service off now with their CPF. The county relies on a quarter percent sales tax, and so part of the quarter percent sales tax goes towards land is dedicated for land preservation. The county years ago did the same thing; they borrowed heavily against future revenues. So two thirds of the money that comes in today that's dedicated towards land preservation goes towards debt service. Um, I appeal to, now go back a few years and that was the way it started and the county's finances were pretty bad when I started in 2013 and we were borrowing money for operating expenses. So that was not sustainable. So then, then you jump ahead to 2020 the 2020 budget was a was a uh, almost like a balanced budget for the county, and the county's budget is over three billion dollars a year. It's a big budget, and we got to the point where we wouldn't have to borrow money for operating expenses. And then the pandemic hit in 2020, and and we really pulled back. We we had a meeting, special meeting of the capital budget work group to try to say what capital projects are really essential. We didn't know what was going to happen at the beginning of the pandemic, and. Um, what we didn't know was that the sales tax revenue was going to go like this. And then we got federal money. And in the last few years, we paid off a tremendous amount of, um, of debt, old debt, like hundreds of millions of dollars in old debt was paid off in the last three budgets. So I called a year ago, more than a year ago, I called the Comptroller, John Kennedy, and I called Steve Malone, the county executive. And I said, can we, since we have this money now, can we pay the debt off? We were, and we were paying other debt off. Can we pay off the debt on the land preservation portion? And I didn't, I didn't get a yes. <laughs> but what, what um, the county executive did, he said, I'll put a $100 million in the capital program and for farmland preservation only. $10 million a year. So, and I was chair of the capital budget. And the, the county's capital budget was about $100 million a year, right, for the county's capital expenses. That was like considered pretty normal. So um, he put the money in. The first year was only $5 million two years ago. This year, uh, we're going to authorize $10 million. So it's got to be it's got to be in the capital budget, and then we're going to hopefully authorize it. We have a public hearing on the 7th in Riverhead on the 7th. We can authorize that $10 million, and we can use that towards uh, purchasing farmland. But that's countywide. So that doesn't go far because there are still a few farms in, in Western Suffolk. They're very high value, uh, we, but we preserve you know, farmland in, in Western Suffolk, to be, to be fair with the people who live in those communities who, who want to see that farmland. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what do you think agriculture is going to look like uh, on Long Island 20 years from now? Gosh, I wish you could tell me. <laughs> because when you, like I said, when I grew up, I always thought it was going to be potatoes. It really was, because you, they were successful when I was a kid in the 60s, so it really looked like that was the market. It's got to be what we have here going for us. And I remember uh, a professor came from Cornell. Gosh, he spoke to the farm group in, in Riverhead probably 10 years ago. 
and he was concerned about climate change. And so if you have a big drought in the Midwest, if you have a big drought in California, if you have uh, Brazil, India, there's a big agricultural producing areas. If you have big weather events there, you're gonna affect the price globally of, of commodities. Mm -hmm. So what the Northeast has, he said, is climate change, you're still gonna have adequate rainfall. You probably won't have these uh, historically horrible weather events that are gonna harm agriculture. <coughs> so he said the Northeast, climate-wise, he felt was positioned well to, to grow things, right? And now, you know, with the winter the way it is, um, we used to be able to harvest till, um, till Christmas a lot of the full crops, the cabbage, cauliflower, kale, and um, And I know some some growers are doing these high tunnels. They tried it. They tried the high tunnel probably 20 years ago, unheated, one sheet of plastic. You grow it greens in the ground. Um, they ran into a couple hard winters. Then they tried to heat it, and then you're heating a plastic greenhouse for the winter with a wind blower. It's really difficult, and you're of course the economics aren't. So there's a lot of opportunity on Long Island because of our climate and because of our soil. And our soils are some of the, really the best in the world. And so you can grow a lot of things. Now, a lot of people are, so someone spoke at the Ag Forum, and um, he, was, he was from the Caribbean. And what was he talking about growing? It was like, um, oh God, oh, not ginseng, a ginger. So there's a lot of crops that people are looking at and people are talking about, like, maybe if you start growing olives here. Yeah, there's a lot. Because, you know, people grow figs, right? So now all of a sudden there's a lot of crops that because of climate change, maybe they would survive. And maybe it'd be a niche market for it locally produced because when it's locally produced, you're harvesting it right. You're getting your full nutritional value. You're really going to enjoy it. You know, as opposed to, you buy a tomato in the store now, it's a tomato, but it was grown in a greenhouse. Um, a long ways away, and so it's not going to have the same, the same flavor and the same nutrition. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of potential. People want to explore it, and there's a lot more animal agriculture um, than when we were growing up. Our, our grandfather raised steers for the family, so we always had, and you grew up, you know, the freezer full of grass-fed beef. You were like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You didn't realize really what you, the, the quality of the meat was, was incredible. Um, so now there's a lot more because there's, um, you know, people appreciate that, that quality of, of, you know, product, whether it's meat or, or vegetables or, or anything else, you know, the locally produced. And it's, uh, there should always be a market. Was there a question? Oh, turmeric. That was, was the there? other thing you said you could raise here. Turmeric. Yeah, ginger and turmeric. Al, as a as a farmer, what's your view of um, the water supply out here? Sure. So, so um, as as a kid, in the evenings, in the in the summer, you could hear everybody's irrigation motor motor running, and they had those big UD nines and UD twelves, the big international diesel. And you, hear, you could hear them in the evening, right, when it was quiet. And um, the water use was very seasonal because on the farm you irrigated when you only, only had to. Um, I've sat in many water meetings with the county. People are very concerned, and they should be, about water use. So there's two things about the, um, uh, our aquifer. One, it's only recharged by rainwater. So if you look at all the roads, we have an old town, almost 400 years old. All the roads were designed to drain all of our rainwater into the creeks and bays. And that's what they did years ago. So years ago, there was an effort in town to direct that, uh, to redirect that stormwater back into the ground so it didn't go into the creeks. The reason behind it was because of shellfishing, because if you're, you're draining all the upland into the creeks and bays, you're, you're loading the creeks and bays with pathogens. If you've got pathogens, the DEC is going to close you down to shellfishing, they're going to close your bathing beaches. So that was, a, that was a push of time back in that like 80s and 90s. We've got to do something about stormwater. Well, the, the big benefit when you take, when you dead end those pipes, 
and you have proper drainage, you put all your storm water into the aquifer, that's a, you get an inch of rain on the whole North Fork, that's a lot of gallons of water that are going directly into the aquifer. So from a quantity standpoint, it's really critical to have, you know, the, this, in the wetland code, there's drainage provision, town-wide, there's a drainage provision. So you're, everyone's trying to put the water back into the aquifer, recharge it, so we save all that, all that water. From uh, an agricultural perspective, it's, um, it was hard, I sat in a lot of these meetings, uh, this water quality meeting, it's hard to quantify. If you look at the farm here at Peconic on the main road, we don't irrigate that much. If irrigation is not only expensive, but it's very time consuming to set everything up. So it's an economic factor on a farm. You're only gonna irrigate if you have to irrigate. The farm next door, it's got a big turbine on a big well, probably you know eight or 10 inch uh, uh, well. It hasn't been used in probably close to a decade. The farms next door, they're all in the vines. Very, again, very little water use, big turbines. If you counted all the, all the wells, all the casings, you'd say, wow, that's, that's so many gallons per, per acre. But they don't use that water. So it's hard to quantify the water use because it's really based on the crop that year. Otherwise, it could be zero. So um, it's, uh, it's a big concern a water use, but there was never a problem with the aquifer when everybody had potato fields covering the whole North Fork because they, all the wells pulled from the shallow aquifer. They, didn't, they weren't deep down. And you weren't, public supply well is covering like a huge a service area, one well. You're pulling a tremendous amount of water from one spot. These were all spread out throughout the whole North Fork. So it never really impacted the, the water supply. Plus, or the rest of the year, the farm is recharging all the rainwater. But the water, yeah, the water is, a, is critical, and there's been a lot of thought about, in general, you know, water, water quantity use, and, and not just quality, but quantity, because it is concerning. There's a, there's, there is a limit, right? We're trying to do everything we can do, town and countywide, and the state did a great job. They repaved the main road. I don't know, probably close to 20 years ago, but they did a tremendous job. They used to be huge pipes behind Focus Park's hardware here in South Hall, mm -hmm. and behind, it used to be the Hess Dish by Bay Avenue and Madison. I mean, six foot pipe draining the main road into the creek. So you can imagine the water quality um, effect. And all that water now is recharged into the aquifer. The state did a great job. Thank you. That was my question <laughs> originally. <laughs> Um, and two, one is a small question, the other is a little larger. Um, you're going to continue to maintain Kropsky's farm stand on Skunk Lane? Uh, no, that became a, a, a labor problem. We just didn't uh -huh. have the time to do Slim it. Slim Lane, that was my favorite. Sorry. <laughs> so, our farm, we have, so we have that farm there. Uh, there's 28 acres in the back there. And we, we live back there, but we also have it's a very good productive soil. And if you look at farmland, that's part, that's called neck land, because we were on little neck. And there is a pebble bigger than your, your thumbnail on that whole farm. It's just this beautiful, light, sandy soil. It's really, really productive. It's, it's really lovely to farm. You go, some of the farms, and, and it's uh, kids, my father and grandfather, um, they farmed some of the land up um, north of the North Road here in Peconic, and the rocks, and they would hit rocks, not just rocks, but rocks big, this big. And what they would do is that they and it would destroy their, you know, equipment. So they would dig up. You couldn't dig the rock out. So they would dig down around the rock and then dig it, dig it down, and dig it down, and dig it down under it and sink the rock down to make a farm on the top. So yeah, the, so that so that but that's a long story about rocks, but. <laughs> But the but the farm there is very productive. We still we still live there. And we still farm. Love it there. Um, the other question: When we came today, we passed a habit pound on this farm, yeah. and I have a fear that that's going to be sold to developers for housing or something. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's a chance that could be preserved as farmland. Good question. If you need a voluntary seller. Um, I think the town or the county would entertain that. That was farm, all farmland there. There is, um, so, and, and I've had this debate at the county level. It's, 
It doesn't have to be row crops to be farmed. It can be, it, sh it could be farmed, right? If somebody's gonna buy that, they could do something completely different with it. So there's nothing wrong with preserving it as farmland today, even though it looks like it needs a lot of work. Because it certainly could, it's good land, it's good ground there, it could be farmed. I also sit on the, um, um, the, the Ag Protection Board in Southern County. Buying up farmland all over the world with the hope of controlling the world's food supply. Are there any programs in place in the United States to protect our farmland from foreign countries taking it over? That's a, that's a very good question. So there's, there's um, and it's not just the farmland, it's the technology. If you look at less than 2% of the people in the country are raising food for everyone else. It's kind of like, you're, you're kind of like in a tenuous position here. And I'm the average age of the farmer. So you're kind of, this is a, food production in this country is, is critically important. You know, I talked about the, the environment and how, you know, Mother Nature can shut down a, a farm production in a hurry. Um, to have someone come in from a different country and buy the land up, it is, it is concerning because you're gonna, it, they might be, they don't have to pour food to the highest bidder, they're not gonna, they're not gonna sell it, you know, to, to who we think they should sell it to. So it, it is it is a concern, and it's also, and I, I read in one of the farm journals that somebody was from another country was digging up corn seed. These these seed companies spend so much money and so much research developing different varieties. Maybe they're more drought tolerant. Maybe they're more you know insect disease tolerant. So to try to minimize your inputs of chemicals, try to in, minimize your inputs on uh, water or fertilizer, and so much technology goes into this. That, um, that people are trying to steal the seed out of the ground so they don't have to do the research because trying to do the research on the plant genetics is really, really complicated. I took a little genetics in college. I don't want to, I didn't understand it. <laughs> but it's, so it's, yeah, it gets very complicated when you think about trying to feed the whole population. Very few people trying to feed the whole population. Uh, food security is a, is a big, My brother and I grew up down the road from you, and uh, when I was a kid, it was kind of like a rite of passage to, uh, when you turn 12, to start working on the farm, and pretty much do so until you turn around 16, but um, unfortunately, we're, we worked at Kanarski's, not at Krupski's, right next door to you. <laughs> but um, I was just wondering, do you get many kids that age coming to uh, work for you, or? No, but it's, it, that's, that's part of the problem. Um, all the kids that you know, worked for us back then, they got paid, and you, maybe you got paid for per quart to your kids rubber, right? Or so many dollars for a bushel of beans, or so many dollars for a bushel Every of Every palace I still have on my hands. Oh, uh, stop, <laughs> stop complaining, Mark. <laughs> 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 But, so you got paid that way, it was piecework, and you learned to show up on time, you learned to dress, you needed a hat or something to bring a water bottle. You learned all those life lessons when you were a kid working on the farm. Now, if you have to pay a 14-year-old $15 an hour and deduct, you know, workers' comp and, and federal withholding and, and um, Social Security, they're not, they're not, they're kids. You know, they can't, they can't do that kind of work, and you can't expect to pay them that much. And um, I, the, uh, the current governor, when she was lieutenant governor, she came out to speak in Riverhead to the Farm Bureau. And I asked her, I said, you know, this, this I, I get it, you, you want to raise the minimum wage and everything, but people aren't going to hire kids at $15 an hour and do all that paperwork to hire kids. And they don't, they're not going to learn those life lessons. And, um, that's that's what we that's what we have. So it's hard, yeah. Hiring kids on the farm is, is almost a lost uh, a lost thing. And they did uh, carry an irrigation pipe. How many? How many? I mean, you must have all those memories of carrying an irrigation pipe on a hot day in the mud, right? <laughs> so, um, um, but yeah, a lot of that's a lot of that's disappeared. Before you mentioned about the uh, oil preservation, and I understand you said there's two 
types of preservation, one living preservation for the South Fork and then the fallen preservation for Justice Town. No, no. So, well, so there's, there's different funding sources. So the county has their own funding source for, for open space and farmland preservation. The county also has the $10 million a year for just farmland. And it's the same, it's the programs run the same way. If you're a landowner, you come in and you get, it's the same mechanic for both. The, it's just a different money source. For the, for the five east end towns, we have the, the CPF, the 2% tax. And, but each town collects their own money. So it's only the transfers in each town, and that's why the South Fork gets 85% of the money. So it's, it's based on the transfers within that town. But that money, that water, you know, they get that, that county water. Well, the, co the county is, 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 comes from the quarter percent tax, which is collected countywide. And part of the quarter percent, so some of it is dedicated towards land preservation. Some of it's dedicated towards um, sewer stabilization, because there's 180 plus sewage treatment plants in Suffolk County. And so uh, it, it's, they, and they always need a new pump, they always need a million dollars to fix the pipes or whatever. Um, and I sat on sewer agency for nine years. But part of that quarter percent goes to stabilize their rates, so their rates can't go up more than three percent a year. So that quarter percent is, is divvied out, it's not just for land preservation. And so it goes for very good water quality improvements. The, uh, you know, we did too, if you go down um, on Greenport Harbor, Greenport Village, two road ends that used to run all the stormwater into the, into the harbor, and now that stormwater is captured and goes into the aquifer. So, um, because they want to keep the harbor clean, they've got oyster groves right there. So, um, that's, that's a, um, you know, that, that's, hopefully that clarifies the funding stream. <coughs> Well, I mean, thank you, Al. You were so generous in not just answering our questions, but letting us really run the gamut of any question that we could ask. So we appreciate that. And what a great audience with such great questions. Um, thank, thank you so much, because this, this is really uh, You know, agriculture is really important, not only to this community, but when I started as a legislator, the seal of the legislature is a plow, and the seal of the Suffolk County is a bull. Really strong agricultural symbols, and so, and they, you know, they, they, this is a, this is an important industry. And we talk about food security, and it's, it is something to be concerned about, you know, for the next generation. So thanks for asking. So thanks for having me. Well, I really appreciate much. the work the Historical Society does. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, for putting this on. It's really good to communicate these different types of. Not only the history, but the way it, it transitions into the current current climate here in in the town. So the historical societies are really it really important. Well, we're lucky. You know that I know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're lucky to have people that like you that are willing to give their time and, and just kind of talk of your own experience. It's firsthand. Right? Thank you. Um, I would just mention that we have one more talk in the series, and that's on a Saturday, May March. No, sorry, March fourth at noon. So we're gonna do a Saturday lecture and that's about the labor camps on the North Fork. Um, and also, if you haven't had the opportunity to visit our Maple Lane complex, we're going to be open. This Saturday is Southfold Winterfest and so there are lots of activities happening in Hamlet, including our shops are open on the main road in the Prince Building and we're giving tours at the complex from one to four. And there are so many other things that you can do while you're in town as well. So we hope to see you this weekend, and if not, hopefully on March 4th. And thank you so much for attending.